Right, good morning, everyone. Um, we're still getting a lot of people joining the meeting, so we're going to wait just a couple of minutes. Um, as you will have noticed coming into the session, um, uh, we have added quite a lot of additional security features to the call uh, in order to prevent a repeat of the Zoom bombing experience we had on Tuesday. Um, so I am very hopeful that that will uh, make things work better for you today in terms of uh, not being uh, quite so frustrating. Um, so just a, a few points. I have enabled chat again, but I have only enabled chat with the host, which is me. Um, and so what that means is that you will be able to send messages, but only I will be able to see them. Um, and that will hopefully, uh, um, that will hopefully prevent us be, being abused as we were last time, uh, which was very unpleasant for everyone, I think. Um, you'll also have seen that I've added a waiting room and I've required people to manually enter the passwords. Uh, that's why we're still getting a lot of people joining. Um, we will continue to let them in as we go. Um, and uh, we're on 141 participants so far, but we, we are expecting a lot more. Um, on the other hand, of course, um, we uh, are aware that uh, you'll have competing priorities and so we will get going in a few minutes. Um, I'd just like to point out also that in general, we will likely, uh, we may well start switching off your video feed. Please don't take this personally if we do it. It's just unfortunately that one of the ways in which we were attacked in the last webinar was that people started sending very unpleasant uh, informa uh, graphic uh, photography and other things through the, way the, uh, the, the video feeds. And so if we get a repeat of that problem, we're going to try and shut the video down for participants so that you don't get the same problem. At the moment, everything is looking very stable and we feel confident that we're not going to have a repeat of the experience, but we're going to stay very, very uh, vigilant to shut anything down that starts up straight away. So with all of those introductions in mind, and as more people start to join or continue joining, um, uh, we're very glad to have you all here, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Naduma Glamini from the AAU, who will just provide a short word of introduction. Over to you, Naduma. Good uh, morning from West Africa. Good afternoon to those that are in the southern part of Africa. We welcome you to this webinar where we will be learning or continuing to learn and today we are focusing on what to teach during the lockdowns. My name is Anudu Motlamini. I work for the Association of African Universities here in Ghana and I bring you greetings from the Association of African Universities uh, Secretary General of the AAU whose names are Professor Etienne Ehile. And we are excited to be hosting these uh, four webinars jointly with OER Africa. From the perspective of the Association of African Universities, this is our way of supporting academic staff in Africa so that you, you can be assisted to cope during the COVID lockdowns. We understand, of course, that there are many other challenges that you are facing, but we believe that uh, through capacity building, many people can be assisted to keep the, the doors of teaching, learning and research open. So I would like to wish all of us a successful webinar today and please don't forget to attend the other follow-up webinars. The follow-up webinar for today will happen on the 4th of May and then the last one on the 8th of May. I also welcome you to access the AAU website on aau.org and check out the COVID-19 page that we've created there 
it contains a number of useful resources that can assist you either as an academic or as an institutional leader. Thank you very much and I wish us a, a great day. Thank you, Neil. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to number two. Uh, in this particular webinar, we're going to try and get down a little bit more um, practical, perhaps. Uh, the webinar one was very much about what are the essential principles and what do we need to keep in mind in terms of the uh, how people learn during these ERT sessions. And today we're going to go continue with that, but we're going to try and dig down a little bit uh, deeper. And uh, therefore, we would very much like to hear from you during the course of the webinar. It's not just me talking. I'm going to espouse some ideas, but we very much would like to hear what you guys have experienced and what you're doing. So you heard earlier, perhaps if you've come in only now, Neil gave us a briefing right at the beginning. Um, we are going to be using the chat facility. So can you send your queries and questions to him? You won't be able to see what other people are, do, are saying, but he will then feed to me some of the things that I should respond to. So we can still have a backwards and forwards. However, we want to make sure the security is a lot tighter this time uh, after the unfortunate events in the previous webinar. All right, so here's our team for today. Uh, Nundomo has already introduced herself and uh, she is our coordinator, our host from the AAU. I am going to be your facilitator today. I am from OER Africa and a little bit more about me in a moment. Neil is keeping a lid on things. He's in the back room there monitoring uh, what's going on and keeping us in good stead. Um, he's from OER Africa as well. Co-project director is his title there. And Kathy is our muscle. She is making sure that you guys all get in all right and that you are happy and safe. All right, so Kathy, thank you very much. She is also from OER Africa. Um, when we looked through the, the, let me get the next one. When we looked through the um, feedback from the previous webinar, a number of people mentioned that they didn't even know what the facilitator looked like. And maybe it's just as well because um, I'm rather woolly after five weeks of national lockdown and two weeks of self-isolation. So I'm a very hairy character at the moment, but I've put a picture up for you there and I might try to get the video going in a moment. Um, it's interesting that the comment did come through. One of the things we normally ask our online facilitators is that they let people know who they are and what they're up to. So there's a little tip that even I didn't take to heart last time. So lecturers should create an online presence to show students that they are there, that they are involved, and that they are supportive. You might remember from webinar one, we mentioned that e-learning might sound sexy, but it's a very difficult environment for the learners. And therefore, they often feel isolated, they feel cut off, they are um, not sure that people even care. And so it's very important that you have your online presence and that you are supporting them. All right, so there's me. Um, if you're really interested, you can have a look at my YouTube channel. I like one of my hobbies is photography and video. Uh, Flickr as well is a repository of uh, photographs that I've taken over the years. They all have an open educational resource license, so you can take them and use them as you like. Uh, you might be interested in my LinkedIn profile. I think that's more of appropriate for our relationship. So if you'd like to get in touch and uh, join uh, the network, then uh, click on the access button and I think LinkedIn would work well. I'd like to keep track of what you're up to and what you're doing and you can find out what we're up to. And if you really want to get chummy, you can join me on Facebook. I'm not a very big poster on Facebook. I'm a really, I'm a tired old git. So there's not a lot of exciting things on the Facebook, but yes, if you want to 
have that type of interaction, then there's a Facebook link as well. All right, that's enough about me. Let's move on. What are we going to do today? All right, so this piece fits into our bigger puzzle. Last time, we, as I said, we had looked at teaching effectively during campus closure. Quite a high level, we identified some very important principles, which we called elements, and gave you an overview and a little tips and tricks using PowerPoint. All right, today we're focusing in what to teach during the campus closure. All right, some things lend themselves more to ERT than others. So we're going to give you some uh, ideas about what you might choose. And then keep in mind, on following on from that, in number three, on Monday, we're going to be looking at how can you tell if learning is actually happening. So we're going to look at activities and assessment and dig down a bit deeper there as well. We're going to look at quizzes as one of the assessment tools that you might use. And the fourth one is on Friday, a week on Friday, communicate effectively during campus closure tips and tricks. We're going to look at Facebook and WhatsApp and how you might use them and so on. All right. Okay. Onwards. What are we going to do today? All right. Today's agenda goes like this. Um, Andrew. First, Matt, yes. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, there's a few requests from people uh, to ask if there's any way. Uh, unfortunately, your screen seems to be slightly out of focus. Um, I'm not yeah, sure if that's a uh, connectivity problem, if you're connected well on your side, but if you could just have a quick look at that as you proceed. But, uh, I mean, we can read everything. It's just not quite focused, but uh, let's do the best we can. All right. Um, I'll also kind of explain what's on the screen so uh, in case it's not clear. Just also, uh, well, it's, it's all legible. For those people who are putting the query, I think uh, some of this is to do with um, connectivity having been... Uh, limited in terms of high definition uh, by Zoom because of the extensive use of the, the platform there, sir. Um, so it will hopefully settle down. Other people are saying it's clear on their side. So let's just keep going and see if how it goes. Cool, okay. All right, so today's agenda. We've basically got four pieces, five if you count our little tips and tricks section. Uh, number one, are we gonna look at what aspects of the curriculum, what topics lend themselves specifically to ERT? and to try and guide you that if you have an option, maybe try and identify those topics for this, this latest round of ERT. Number two, we're going to look at how to choose activities, resources, and digital tools that also suit ERT. Yeah, this came up, a number of you in the previous webinar said, oh, but we've got ba uh, poor bandwidth and so on and so on. How do we change things for for that environment. So we'll also look at some of those type of questions. Number three, we're gonna look at when you do uh, ERT, is it possible to do more sophisticated uh, teaching? Does it have to always be these very small nuggets? And we're gonna argue that if you get yourself organized, you can sequence these ERTs to teach sophisticated knowledge sets or uh, to get them to master specific skill sets. So we'll show you how we think you might be able to do that. And then number four, a lot of your institutions already have the technology that would improve your ERT teaching, a learner management system. And so we're going to introduce what these things are and try and show you how you might use them. And if, you, if your institution does not have one, or if you feel that that particular section of your university is so hard to approach because they're all overwhelmed at the moment themselves, we'll show you how to put up your own personal LMS so that you don't have to go through someone else and right at the end then we're going to um, have an opportunity to go in and look at one of these free personal LMSs we're going to look at Google Classroom and just give you four little tips and tricks to get you going so if you want to go that route you can so that's our agenda for today if you are interested in the resources that are part of this presentation then we have a classroom running at the moment in Google Classroom, and you can go in there, there's the code. We are getting some people telling us that they can't get in. So we're not quite sure why yet. The capacity is 250, but we only have 140 people in the classroom. So we'll keep monitoring that. However, should you fail and not 
be able to get into the classroom, then all of the resources from all the webinars will appear on the OER Africa website. There's a now place for them. And the webinar one resources are already in position. And then this afternoon, we'll start loading in the webinar two resources as well. So there is another way that you can get hold of the resources, including the playback of this webinar and also um, the, this, this presentation. So if you want to use this presentation and adapt it for your own needs at your own institution, maybe you can take this and run with it as a uh, staff training for your department, your unit, maybe for staff in general, then please feel free just to take it and adapt it as you see best. All right, let's get going. Keep in mind, we're about to start. And keep in mind that we are interested to know what you're thinking. So please use the chat facility and um, then uh, Neil will feed me stuff and I can try and respond to them. Okay, I'm just checking at the moment. I'm looking at my WhatsApp. Okay, right. So number one. How do you choose materials and topics that actually suit remote teachings, ERT? And the, um, we need to point out that ERT is a difficult environment, partly because it's new for you and partly because it's new for the students. And so there is a lot of concern and worry and con uh, perplexion about how all these pieces might fit together and, uh, and help learning to continue. And what topics lend themselves to ERT? And you'll, you'll notice that some things are much more easy to teach or easier to teach uh, online than other aspects. It says there's some parts of the curriculum are notoriously difficult. Some people in the previous webinar were asking, um, how do I do um, skills evaluation? How do I do some type of formal assessment and so on? And so those are well known to be quite difficult, not impossible, but you need to be really organized, very comfortable with the technology and on top of your game if you're going to teach those things. So we would kind of argue that if you are new to ERT that, and especially to online technologies uh, for teaching, then we would say rather go for the low hanging fruits to start with. And if you have to reorganize your curriculum um, uh, to choose pieces that suit themselves, then we would say do that. Don't feel that you have to be trapped into the curriculum unless the curriculum sequence is of particular importance. Um, all right, so um, however, it can be argued that some sections are actually better taught online than they are in a lecture. Uh, we are of the opinion that lectures are particularly poor mechanisms for teaching and learning. Uh, research has shown, for example, that the lecture has a terrible retention rate. The percentages are different according to which article you read, but they're all very low. It looks like it goes in one ear, and maybe it doesn't even do that, and then straight out the other ear of the student sitting in the lecture hall. Okay, you get a couple of kids who are really there on uh, listening to every word and absorbing, but for the vast majority of people, the lecture is pretty poor. So we would say even a video of a lecture is better than a lecture. And the reason why it's a silly one, but it's a good one, is that people can stop it and rewind and um, listen to a section again. Maybe they were distracted because they were flirting with, a, with the girl in the front row there. And then, oh, they've lost the thread of your argument. Well, with a video, one, they wouldn't be flirting. And two, uh, it would be possible to rewind and, and listen to how the thread works between your argument. So in some ways, videos provide a lot more control over um, uh, exposition. So when the student is trying to follow you, there are devices so that they can keep track of what you're doing. And that's another good reason why we are publishing the webinar recordings, because we're thinking to sit there for an hour and a half is pretty ma a marathon session. So maybe there are some things that you are hearing and you go, ooh, ooh, 
that's interesting. But then by the time you, they, you've uh, come back to what I'm saying, I've moved on. So you've lost some of the thread. So you can use the webinar recording either to go back and listen to bits and pieces. You don't have to listen to it in its entirety. And we've put timestamps on so you can jump around as well. And we'll do the same for this webinar. All right. So I really like this resource. This resource uh, that's on the screen at the moment tries to show you how face-to-face -face teaching conditions are now reinterpreted for remote teaching conditions. It's a beautiful little resource uh, developed by, I think they call themselves SILT, the user S, C-I-L-T, which is a unit working out of UCT, Cape Town. And um, they're very interested in the role of technology and education, and they run little courses and so on. So they have released this resource, as you'll notice at the bottom, as an OER. So um, they've encouraged us to take it and run with it. And as long as we uh, attribute where it came from. And so let's have a look carefully. The green band says that if you want to present content, in the old days, we would use the lectures and we'd use demonstrations if we wanted a class environment. And if we were out of class, we would hand them a whole load of readings or tell them to go to the library to sit in the reserve book room and uh, look at uh, various books and documents. But what does that mean now? So in the next third and fourth columns, you'll see now that we're encouraging you to do virtual lectures. All right, so you could do a webinar -y type thing like I'm doing now, or you might um, record uh, one of your lectures and then give them the video so that they can have a look. And the same with demonstrations, your practicals or so on. Whereas previously you could watch them do it, now it's not as good. You have to demonstrate something and there's hope that they can um, work out from the video or, uh, or from the screen capture what you are doing. Uh, you notice that column is called synchronous. Okay, so do I have, okay. Um, it's called synchronous. Synchronous simply means uh, teaching in real time. So um, if we want to do a virtual lecture in a synchronous environment, then it would have to be live. So that's the thinking that you'd have to advertise when you are going to do the virtual lecture and then make sure everyone has access to your stream. Your ICT department might be video video you, or you might just simply use the cam on your laptop. Um, but somehow people need to know when you are about to lecture so they can watch it in real time. Asynchronous simply means they can watch it in their own time, obviously within parameters, but means that uh, on demand more. So uh, readings, recorded lectures, uh, screencasts and simulations, videos, etc., would all be pre recorded and then the students can access them asynchronously. So you can see there's slight change, well, a significant change from the face to face conditions to the remote teaching conditions. Uh, engage students in learning activities is the next row. And um, here, one of the types of things we used to do, we used to have uh, tutorials, we used to have pracs, uh, perhaps even a whiteboard session where you would um, project things onto the smart board and then you'd be able to manipulate them in certain ways. Um, when we were out of class, we would encourage students to go into group work, uh, uh, well, into group work groups, into, uh, to uh, work uh, and create projects or assignments. But what does that mean now in our ERT uh, environment? So now, if it had to be synchronous, then the tutorials would have to be something like what we're doing now. But hopefully when in a smaller group, you can have all the mics on and all the videos on and then they, the smaller group can act and work together, discuss issues, they can try and work out solutions to problems and so on. So obviously the tutorial now needs to be rethought. How would you do that? Virtual group discussions. Some of these webinar platforms have breakout groups. So you can take a larger group and say, all right, we're gonna put you in groups of six or 10 and we're gonna put you into a breakout group. So people are using Moodle as their learner management system. For example, are experimenting with the plugin 
which allows these breakout groups called big blue button. And I think most LMSs have some such module that you might want to investigate. That's synchronous. But again, the beauty of ERT is that it doesn't always have to be live. It, the idea, ideally, students should be able to study on demand. So asynchronously, we've got things there like online discussion forums, online annotation tools, Google Docs, blogs, etc., are all the types of tools where students could come in in their own time, add to what the class is doing, and then come back later and see what has happened since they were last in there. In terms of building communication and a community, um, previously we would have groups and discussions. Out of class, we would link each other with email and with office hour consultations. They used to come to your office and then sit there and bemoan their, their poor fate. Um, but what can we do now? All right, so in a remote environment, we can now have online chats and you're beginning to play in the chats. I um, still haven't seen my, my list of chat things, okay. And um, we could have a virtual office hours. I did hint at this in the last webinar that one of the things faculty can do is that they can uh, field questions virtually throughout the week and then put together a little compilation of what the main issues were that arose during the week. So we could say, for example, this video would um, be an attempt to let the whole, everyone know that you are tracking what they're doing, that you have seen certain things coming up which are problematic and which should be um, uh, shared with everyone, the solution should be shared with everyone and so on. You could use Twitter according to this or any social media. And my experience is WhatsApp groups work beautifully with this. So um, as I tend to advocate a WhatsApp group. Asynchronous, don't forget your good old email. Email is still very powerful, and especially in low bandwidth environments, email is still king. All right, so keep that going. Online discussion forums, we will look at a few of those today. And a Q&A page or in a place where people can write up what the issue was and what the solution was. And then the last row, conduct assessment. We're gonna look at this in a lot more detail in webinar three, but previously you would, you would do quizzes and exams and presentations. Out of class, you would look for essays, reflection journals and projects, and nothing really changes here. Most of what we could do there, we can now do remotely as well. So you can still get uh, the, uh, assessment done online. And we're gonna look at all different ways that it might be done. Admittedly, summative assessment is an issue, but it's not, un, it's not impossible, but it needs very careful planning. And uh, yeah, and we'll talk about that in the next webinar. Uh, asynchronously, quizzes, reflection journals, projects and tests and so on. So I think you're getting the idea here that everything we used to do can be transferred across to ERT, um, but uh, it, in all instances, it's going to require some new skills and it's going to require a little bit of creativity to actually set it up so that it performs the task that we wanted it to do. So Andrew? Yes. Uh, just to, to pause you quickly there, um, I think we are getting some problems still with the feed. I'd like to try and, and share the slides from my screen and see if that helps solve the problem. All right, it's the same set that you picked up earlier. Yeah. So in the meantime, we've had one question so far, which reads as follows. Maybe you can respond while I switch them. In my experience, also supported by research, online discussion forums are not utilized effectively by students unless one grades the discussions. Any suggestions? And then the second one, the virtual mm -hmm. consultation hour is very important. We have four sessions per week. Our students have been making great use of, have been making use of this extensively to their great relief. We have 984 students in this module. Using our institutional platform, it is now zero rated. Email communication still requires students to have data. So just two, two observations there. Uh, if you can maybe respond to those while I switch the slides and see if that helps. Okay, cool. I'm gonna stop sharing so you can take it.
All right, I'm hoping you can still hear me. Um, I have I've stopped you sharing my screen. Okay, good. I'm going to go through those uh, um, three observations. Um, the first one was about the discussion forums and how students um, often don't respond well. Okay, and part of the problem is many of our students don't like to write. Okay, so um, if you have an environment where, uh, well, if you have a, a, a discussion question which requires quite an articulate expression, some people just don't feel comfortable writing. Um, the, that's not to say it's for everyone. Some people just think that they can hide because you can't see them, that they, that they don't have to um, expend any energy and then you need to uh, mention that this is unacceptable and that, you're, that their performance is being uh, monitored. Uh, the, the person who suggested the idea was that it should be for marks. That's a very good idea and it works. Um, if people know there are marks attached to the discussion, then they will try harder. The, the sad thing is for you, that means it's extra work. You've got to go behind and allocate some marks to uh, the discussion. Um, the other thing is that if you have set up your course in such a way that it's engaging and that the discussion isn't just an attempt to understand that they have comprehended the reading but they are discussing something specifically pertinent about how the reading applies to something, okay, so perhaps to a problem or to a community issue, where it is not a direct repeating of what they found in the article, but rather about how they would apply what they've read in the document, then it's more likely people will get engaged and interested in what people are saying and also write something meaningful as well. So again, I'm afraid it's carrot for most of these things, you'll notice that the answers are a carrot and or a stick. All right. And in this case, the carrot would be making the discussion something engaging, something of interest, something which um, is, is intellectually stimulating. But then the stick might be something like the marks or the fact that you say that you are monitoring their uh, engagement in the discussions. Okay, so that's, I, I agree with that first group. And then another uh, observation was that in terms of student support, office hours, the idea of faculty support sessions are key. In fact, I think they said critical. And I would endorse that very strongly. I think you can't just put stuff out there and hope that um, students will engage with them in a meaningful way. You need to have a support system. In some ways, a support system is giving real proper support in terms of guidance and advice and solving technical problems and so on. But on the other hand, it's also just giving out the message that faculty cares and that faculty is involved and that faculty is trying to uh, support their learning process. So yes, well done to that team who's, who, who, who suggested um, a very meaningful and structured office hours support mechanism. And then they also mentioned that, or I don't know if it's the same person, but another person mentioned that their LMS, their education institutional LMS is zero rated, right? So for those people who are not sure what that means, zero rated simply says that for the user, when they go onto that particular LMS, that, that server, that web server, then there is no cost to them. All right, so a student would go onto the university's LMS and not get any data taken away from their account or have to pay for data to get on. It's not that it's free. It means the university has to pay for, um, uh, it's like a reverse payment. So the university would normally pay the service provider to zero rate their, um, their, their LMS. Um, the, if it's not zero rated, then the user the student has to give up their data in order to access all of these tools and the sources that we are mentioning. So it might be an idea to confront management at the university and get them to investigate getting the institutional LMS zero rated against various service providers.
Okay, nice. All right, how are we doing? Are we up? Is that clearer? Yeah, it's much clearer. And uh, oh. just one other observation from Sheila, um, which is that chat forums cannot be left up to students. As teachers, we need to carefully facilitate, weave, and summarize the issues that come up in a chat forum. This needs to motivate students. Sorry, I'm reading out the chats as they come in because copying and pasting from the chat uh, seems to be difficult. Um, but Andrew, everyone is commenting that the slides are much clearer now, so I'm going to stick with them and you just uh, let me know when you want me to advance them. Cool. Okay. Uh, nice. That was also a nice com comment, yes. And the whole idea that even in the chat facility, often we let the, the students go and, yeah, um, they need to be monitored there as well. So just as we had shenanigans uh, on our previous webinar, you need to check that people are staying on point, that they're discussing the issues you want them to discuss, and that you uh, pull them back when they are getting out of hand or have lost their way. So yes, nice, another nice comment, which I think we can share with everyone. All right, so which topics lend themselves to ERT? I've mentioned you should try and make a decision about what's worthwhile doing it, doing it now. And I would say that ideally theory is so much easier to teach online, if not sometimes better than face-to-face, -face, than practical sessions. Practical sessions can be done online, but you need to be very organized, very comfortable with the technology. And you've got to um, realize that any simulation is never as good as the real thing. So if the students were supposed to dissect them, an animal, then a video is all very nice and it is um, and it's useful, uh, but unless they themselves wield the scalpel, then the learning is is not as good as the real thing. So if you if you have to teach practical sessions, then yeah, get yourself very organized, see how far you can take it. You might need to uh, later on reschedule that lab time when they come back into the classroom and uh, pick up the tools uh, uh, so that you can see them in action. Theory is, is lovely online. In fact, um, you can make it really sexy. You don't have too much lecture time. You can actually um, look for existing open educational resources which can supplement what you're doing online. A little bit of video, a little bit of animation. Uh, there are some beautiful simulations uh, uh, which, uh, for science and maths. Uh, it's called HET. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the, in the thing below. Um, so yes, rather prioritize theory rather than practical over these next few weeks while we're in this ERT phase. But don't get put off totally. You can do a lot of practical online. The next one is supervision. Now, some subjects are really quite dangerous and they do need some type of supervision, some master who knows what's going on and can uh, guide the process. So if high levels of supervision are required, and I'm thinking of people like electricians who have to wire boards and uh, obviously electricity is a killer um, and other similar skill sets or um, um, topics or subjects. So uh, if it's a, a subject that requires supervision, rather do the theory now and then call them in later when, we, when the lockdowns are finished for the supervision sections. You'll find they go much more s smoothly because they already have a, an understanding of what's going on, if not the actual skills. Collaborative learning required. It's interesting. Um, Collaborative learning can be done very well online, um, but for new people, it's sometimes a little bit of a, um, a, a difficult field to follow. Um, it, it takes a little bit of skill sets to be in place to really coordinate the uh, collaborative learning online. The technology is available. There's lots and lots of collaborative learning tools. Even your Google Docs, for example, allows multiple people to work on the same document. Um, and it's very easy to use and it's free. So there's lots of nice collaborative learning tools. It's just coordinating collaborative learning sometimes is a bit difficult. And then I've got, is my last one? Sorry, this thing's in the way. Oh, is the course resource intensive? So normally in these type of subjects, 
they um, they would come to class to be able to engage with the sophisticated machinery or or with the various resources or whatever. And again, um, you, you can build little kits and ask people to take them home. But um, if it's a resource intensive subject, it would be easier to do it later when the lockdowns and the ERT is finished. Um, it, again, it is possible, but it takes some planning to get that particularly right. All right, are there any more questions or should we go on to the next slide? So just, just a couple of points. I mean, I think some of them won't have easy answers. I think if one responds to queries, emails or in the LMS, timelessly, students see you as being present. I tweet daily, sometimes just to find out how the students are doing or wishing them a happy Freedom Day in the case of South Africa. I believe that this demonstrates presence. I generally respond within two hours of tweets by students, again, to show them that I'm available. Um, so so okay. that's just some, some additional points. Someone asked about the importance of clinical simulation for medical related fields like nursing and, and medicine, because these need real simulation. Um, so that is a challenge. And then another observation, teaching theory during this time is fine, but assessing is not really possible since all assessments and assignments are essentially open book in, in this person's case. I found that assessing applications are better. Uh, and then lastly, how best can you teach a more practical or hands-on subject online, just as an example, engineering drawing? So I don't suggest that you respond to those directly now, Andrew, but uh, that's just to give a sense of the, the observations coming mm. through. Um, okay, and then what we, are, what, what we are seeing from those comments is that there is a division between the theoretical and the practical uh, uh, subjects. Um, and um, yeah, so I would say, keeping in mind that ERT might go on for some time, but the, the, the planning, and it, we might need these skills in the future anyway. Um, but I would say for now, if you are new to ERT and especially to new, these new technologies, then I would say rather go for the theoretical subjects. Now try and reorganize your curriculum so that you can hit those now while you're learning and while your students are becoming comfortable with the environment. And then where, as you get to these things like evaluation and practicals and uh, simulations and so on, that you'll feel much more comfortable doing that later when your skill set is better and when the students are also comfortable with the environment. As I said, they're not impossible, but they do require some skill and some creativity to get it right. Okay, here are a couple of OER resources which you can take and use. That uh, SILT uh, uh, article um, is available. It's an OER, please use it. I found it very useful. Admittedly, it's from a UCT perspective. Um, so they do talk about the LMS, they use Sakai. They're using a thing called, the, they call it Vula. Um, but you can interchange their uh, technology sets with your own ones. It's, it, but it's a very nice document. And then we've got um, MIT. MIT is experiencing the same problems as you guys are, getting their staff to suddenly embrace um, uh, remote teaching. And so they've put together their own little briefing about, um, so we think of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that they're all uh, comfortable with this, these type of technologies, but even there, they need to um, prep their, their stuff. So that's also an interesting article and some tips in there as well. And then this other reading, this is your article. So um, I thought this one was written some years ago, but it kind of says all the skills that you are now learning to do ERT will actually become embedded in the pe pedagogy for the future. And that the way we teach and students learn is already evolving and changing. And therefore the skill set that you're now acquiring is very timely and will see you in good stead. So that's a quite a nice article as well. Again, all OERs, there's a little Creative Commons licenses below. You will need to download the PowerPoint at the end so that you can click on those things and go through and have a look. All right, let's have a look at the next one. Okay, Neil, can you give me the next one? Thank you. All right, it looks like you don't need a lot of uh, encouragement. You guys are already using the chat well. I can see the numbers going up and down and up and down. Um, 
but um, uh, here's something for you to think about. Um, how much of your course could be covered asynchronously? Okay, we, we kind of feel that if we're not standing in front of our students, learning isn't happening. But surely, I would say, couldn't we say that really about 90% of what we cover in our curriculum um, could be done asynchronously using tools like we are now encouraging you to use an ERT? All right, and we've got three places where you can do this. Uh, you can reply if you want to. Otherwise, you can sit quietly and reflect. But we've got the Zoom chat, which I can see is very active. We've got, got our classroom. So if you want to, I've put up little discussion um, uh, forums in the little classroom. So you, those people who can get in, please do it there. And then earlier we said, um, if you're feeling you're being ignored, you can always email uh, Neil. So that's another option there as well. Have a think. Nice. All right. ERT resource availability. Let me just see if I click on here, if I can. Okay, yeah. I'll put that there. So, sorry, I'm just getting myself organized. All right. So we've mentioned what topics lend themselves to ERT, but what activities, what resources, and what digital tools are kind of suited to this type of teaching? All right. Let's have a look at the next one. Uh, okay, these, yeah, can you key it so these things come down? I should have taken that out. Cool, right. Now in ERT, we're all scrambling, we're all trying to get things up and running. Um, and so my first question in terms of what's suited is obviously digital resources. So have you already digitized your lecture notes? Or are you still got them in paper and you Romeo them off and hand them out perhaps? The, um, in this day and age now, it might be an idea to start getting all your stuff digitized. Um, the, uh, we talked about in the last webinar, maybe getting a PowerPoint up where you can add in some multimedia, you can have graphics and video and sound and so on. So um, I would say it's a strategy you should start working on now if you're not there already. But obviously for ERT, digital just makes so much sense. So start thinking about how do you now take all that intellectual property that you've developed over all these years and now get them ready for this new age. So step one, get it digital. All right. Um, step two would be in this day and age now with OERs and open content and open education and so on, the emphasis is moving away from everyone having their own little silo of resources, um, all the materials that you've developed over the years. And now we're saying we should rather have a, like a collaborative or a sharing environment whereby some of the generic materials, at least, we might share amongst ourselves. So your next trick then I would say is to have a look what exists out there, which is aligned to what you teach which might even be done better than you can. I mean, later on today, I'm going to get you to work through some tutorials. I didn't make them. And the person who did it was vastly superior and more knowledgeable and also better skilled than I was. But I could use their materials as long as I attributed where it came from. So that's the same here. Can you have a look out there what, what OERs exist? What could be stimulated or even adapted to fit into what you teach? Um, obviously, OERs are 99.999% digital. The whole reason that they came about was because of the internet. The internet allowed digital resources to move around globally, and hence the uh, OERs suddenly made sense as soon as that was commonplace. So yes, step two. Have a look what exists out there that you could now assimilate into your courses and, um, and benefit by. And then counter to that, you should start thinking, what of, which of my digital resources lend them, would be useful to others? Maybe there are some materials I should be putting out there which I'm proud of, 
which I know have a generic appeal and uh, could be adapted and used by others. So um, I would say then that step two is quite a good one. We're changing the way we compile our lessons. We've got to now think about how do we do a mashup? How do we take what other people have done and adapt and make it fit what, we, what our curriculum requirements are? Then number three is another thing you need to be very careful of though, especially in Africa, we are not flush when it comes to connectivity or, uh, well, I was gonna say digital devices, but they are becoming quite prevalent. Um, they're not ubiquitous yet, but you'll find digital devices, smartphones, tablets, PCs, and uh, laptops are now becoming much more common. And for higher education, I would say that they're very common place. I would say most students now who have made it this far are now endowed somehow with a digital device. However, connectivity is quite tenuous and it's expensive in most African countries, all right? So the trick then is to be able to put together a set of resources which are easy to download. And therefore, I think we underestimate the power of email and maybe as it's slightly a richer cousin, the social media, I think um, we should still have a strong place whereby uh, these low bandwidth resources and technologies uh, can be used. So um, as much as I'd like to have a virtual environment, a virtual campus, like Second World or something like that, uh, it just doesn't really make sense for us at the moment until uh, our, our infrastructure improves and becomes more cost effective. However, there are options out there which are more low tech. And all right, so here we go. So what is where? And again, I, um, this is an OER that I've, that I've discovered. And I thought, oh, I couldn't, it's better than I could do. So I've stuck it in. Uh, so we can thank Daniel Stanford uh, for putting this together and also um, SILT as well. They say keep your presentation choices as low tech as possible or always provide low tech options for students with access constraints. And this was mentioned by someone in the previous webinar as a real concern for them. All right, so let's have a look at this chart. If we look at the vertical axis, it's got low immediacy on the left and high immediacy on the right. Uh, immediacy simply means how immediate is it in terms of the relationship between the lecturer and the student, okay? So high immediacy would be me talking to you, for example, now, that's quite high immediacy, whereas um, low immediacy would be something whereby I might send the message out, but you not get it for a couple of days. On the other axis, we have low bandwidth versus high bandwidth. So the thinking here is, which of these resources makes sense for your context and your learners? So you're gonna have to say, do, where approximately do my learners fit in which of these quadrants? So we look at low immediacy and low bandwidth. You see reading with text, and images. So a simple text document like a PDF or, a, or even a, a Microsoft Word document where you've got a couple of pictures in there and it's mostly text. And then slightly more immediate would be email because they do come regularly and discussion boards with text and images. So discussion boards um, in your LMS, for example, or um, maybe you set up some social media to, in order to do that, would fit into that green segment. If we want to um, go to the blue segment, then we've got collaborative documents and group chat and messaging, which is very definitely my, like my WhatsApp group would be there. So there's high immediacy, it's flashing in your face um, all the time. Uh, in fact, I have to turn my chats off regularly because they just become overwhelming. There's just too much stuff happening. I am a member of multiple um, course WhatsApp groups and uh, 
yeah so sometimes it's the immediacy is too much um whereas collaborative documents could be something like a wiki or a google docs whereby people are working on it in it could be real time in google docs you can see the other people in the document moving around changing things so that's very immediate um but you don't need high bandwidth in order to do that you just need good old medium and then you can get on with working collaboratively on a document if we have a look at the yellow quadrant if we look at the yellow quadrant you can see there that um pre-recorded video and pre-recorded audio like little podcasts for example can be distributed um sometimes those videos are quite large yes uh, webinar one's video was at six, uh, 92 minutes and it was uh, about 180 megabytes which is quite big and obviously the resolution was low but um that's still a big file and you don't really want people to engage uh, have to use their bandwidth to download that. So you might think for, uh, carefully before giving them video if you're in a low bandwidth environment. Uh, podcasts are a bit better. It's just the audio file. So <clears throat> as long as you're clear and articulate and you don't need to demonstrate anything visually, then you might as well just do it audio. Uh, I have to laugh at some of these e eminent universities. There's one in America, very famous, I Ivy League, and um, they're releasing all their lectures um, to the world as OER. So that's nice. That's cool. But what they do is their lectures are videos of head and shoulders of these rather inarticulate lecturers who might be eminent in their field, but are talking in, and all you can see is their uh, face move and occasionally they stumble around the, the, the lecture hall and you think, well, why didn't they just release this as a podcast? I mean, what benefit was there from it being a video so be careful if you don't have to go visual don't use an audio uh, we've got here asynchronous discussion with audio and an asynchronous discussion with video again you've got to leave these audios and videos embedded in the discussion um, but again it's going to use bandwidth in order to access them so be a little bit careful there immediacy not so great um, they are asynchronous obviously and now we're in the red quadrant, high immediacy, high bandwidth. So what we're doing today is a video conference, basically. Um, and we're trying, so we're up the pointy end here. We're using lots of bandwidth. I've turned my, my uh, video off, but if we were streaming that as well as all of your videos as well, you can imagine the amount of bandwidth that's being used for that. So these video conferences are cool, um, but high bandwidth, but they, they are immediate. They are right in front of you They've, uh, and so on. And then audio conferences, well, we're kind of halfway. We've turned all our video off, and we, but you can hear us. So you can see it's there. Cool. Okay. So just to sum up that screen, try and work out where does your context fit. Uh, are your students in any of these four quadrants? Are they scattered across all four? Because then you might want to go for like a more eclectic approach or a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, or are they predominantly in one of these quadrants and then you need to make um, resource decisions very carefully? Cool. Okay. Um, right, I'll go through this very quickly, this one. This is kind of, uh, this is SILT again. They are, and they're talking to their UCT lecturers. So it's very specific. But the trick is, is that me? Oh, hang on. Sorry, um, on my screen, I had this thing come up and cover it. All right, so I've got rid of that. Um, all right, so maybe um, if you are part, of, you, you can encourage your ICT unit to kind of give you advice, what makes sense within your institution. And you can see what they've done here. They've said, to, uh, uh, how do we distribute written texts? And they give some advice, some tools and tool guides. And then what, um, uh, what is available on campus? So you can see those are the tools in that first in that third column, which uh, is available at that specific university. Audio, 
um, they say, well, what we used to do in terms of talking, they would say, um, now use audio recordings and they say, keep things short. I quite like this advice. Keep things short, cut up the single lecture into 10 to 15 minute little pieces. And again, that kind of fits with what we were saying yesterday about chunking or webinar one about chunking and keeping it concise and then video. And they can say, you can make a narrated PowerPoint. You could create a screencast software. We showed you that in webinar one using PowerPoint. Um, you could go to their little ICT unit and schedule a lecture recording, okay, um, and so on. So maybe then you should encourage your uh, institutional ICT unit to put together some advice about what's available at the institution, uh, what have they already got subscriptions for, um, and if there are gaps, then maybe you can uh, encourage them to fill those. All right, so that's just the way that you can plan how you're going to create your resources. Uh, let me just read this little thing. Okay, that's fine. Let's go on. Again, we've uh, collected a little basket of goodies for you. And the first one is Stephen Downs. Some of you might know him in education circles. He's one of the founders. Well, he's one of the people who articulate the connectivism paradigm about how technology is shaping the way that we learn. And he's, that's lovely, that little resource. So what he's doing is he's not writing it. He's coordinating other lecturers to come on board and then suggest, if you want to do this, then what are the, what are the free uh, tools available to do that? So very nice little like, thing there if you are looking for tools to help you create your content. Uh, uh, SALT, we've mentioned them a few times now. They've also put together a little a video series. There's one of them on low-tech options. And then this last one, I, I, I love it. It's, <laughs> it's a lecturer who's simply saying, well, let's not overthink these things. Can't, instead of having these fancy videos and so on, can't we just use our phone to just make a little video segments? And so she shows you very, very low-tech ways of putting together digital content and uh, she's only got like three followers but i just think she's wonderful so anyway there you go if you're interested going really 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 low tech then have a look at that one okay what else have we got so andrew um yes i thought that it might be nice just to take a, a moment to invite seeing as we seem to have a much more secure and stable meeting today I'm going to invite a couple of people to put their hands up if they'd like to ask some questions um, by audio, and I will unmute them and give them the opportunity. Uh, are you happy to take two or three questions at this point? Yes, yes, that would be great. I want to hear from these guys. Okay, so um, let's give this a try today and see if we can make it work uh, despite the large numbers. If anybody has a question, um, please can you raise your hand, which you should have a, a f feature to do at the bottom of uh of google and then um i will unmute one or two of you i won't be able to take them all uh so i'm going to start with mark so over to you mark hello good morning andrew hello hello good morning Hi, good I can nice. yes so my question is um it has to do with security issues on your lms platform yeah, from experience, um, what I realized is that um, if you create a Google Classroom where you make it open that any student can join with its email or account, um, there will be a case where students will even make the classroom code available to non-students to participate. And so um, what I did was that I had to deploy a gene suit for education, which is an institutional email address so that I can take care of some of these security issues. But mm -hmm. I realized that most students were not able to log in because of this new institutional email. And, and so it becomes a challenge. So how do you deal with such security issues when it comes to you operating your own personal LMS? All right. Uh, to, to be honest, I've only used two personal ones. So I've used Google Classroom. Oh, well, I'm using it at the moment. I'm quite new to it. Uh, and then I've used the uh, Moodle Cloud LMS, where I had total control. 
And um, I, I think th the problem with these personal ones is that on the one hand, you do want to make it as easy as possible for people to access and get in. But then there comes a point when security issues um, do become problematic. So I would say that um, if you are really worried about security issues for your course, then you shouldn't use a personal um, LMS. You should actually get on board with the institutional LMS and make sure that every user is accredited, um, that they all have accounts and they have passwords and that you know who they are and what they're doing, because that is what the LMS really is useful for. It kind of allows you to track your students, to see what they're doing, what they're getting up to, and then obviously grade them and provide them with resources and teaching. So um, I'm afraid if security is a big problem for you, then you got to get behind the walls. You got to get to your LMS, the institutional LMS, and tell them you need, you need their support. In the end, you got to remember, most of us are not technical experts. We are educators. That's our thing. And therefore, um, we might like to play in this area, but when we really do, uh, if, it, if it starts to get very technical, then we need to let the institutional LMS team uh, look after us and uh, approach. Uh, your, your, um, Mark, your query was very specific and I have no idea. I really, I really can't answer that uh, technically, but I, those are my, my views in terms of where you should have your class set up. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one more raised hand if that's all right with you, Andrew. Sure. Okay. And then uh, we'll move on. If, uh, as I unmute you, if you can just uh, keep the question brief, please. And then also should, uh, if others, we're getting some great feedback in the uh, chat. So please, uh, this is a, a group of people with lots of knowledge. So please all feel free to add to Andrew's um, comments and answers. So, Noe Hiri, you're on. You are unmuted. Thank you very much. My question is uh, on the digital content and then EROT. I didn't quite, didn't really get the relationship between, um, you know, the, the, the digital content or digitalizing uh, your content and connecting it to um, ERT. What's, what's the connection between the two? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Maria, good, uh, nice question. In my mind, ERT is your first step into what we would later call online learning. And um, the, they're not the same. ERT is trying to simulate what we were doing previously and set it up so that we can do it remotely. Um, uh, and online learning is a lot more than that. Uh, it, it needs a, um, a, a considered approach whereby you think carefully about how things will be done online. Here, we're just going for it. Um, and therefore, even in ERT, though, for remote teaching, the vast majority, 99% of all the technology we're going to use is digital. So it's either going to be a computer or we're going to use um, an online network or online tools. And therefore, if you are a lecturer, and you want to even just disseminate your notes, you will find now that um, it makes a lot, it's much easier if you have, for example, typed them up and saved them as a um, PDF or as a, a Word document or as some digital uh, artifact, which we can then move around within this online environment. Does that make sense? Good. Let's go on, Andrew, and uh, just to give you a time update, it's uh, far past the hour, so we've got about oh, okay. minutes left. So. Okay, let's get a move on. All right. Um, the next one we're going to be looking at, um, how should you sequence your ERT? Now, I'm a bit scared that the way we've been talking about ERT, you're all thinking, oh, you can only do simple things during ERT, like batches of theory, for example. And I would say, yes, that lends itself to ERT, but you can teach much more sophisticated skill sets or get them to do advanced um, 
uh, acquire advanced knowledge using ERT, but then you need to sequence very carefully your little ERT sessions. So um, I would argue then that you need like to create in your mind when you're planning your ERT sessions that they need to build sequentially on top of each other. So therefore, uh, if you want them to, to acquire a sophisticated skill set, then each of those little building blocks helps them slowly grow and become more proficient at whatever you are trying to get them to do. Um, if it's an advanced knowledge that you're trying to get them to uh, acquire, then again, that advanced knowledge re probably requires a number of sequential little steps to get them there. And then your ERT sessions need to be sequenced in such a way that they can build uh, on each other. Uh, so it's not just anything can be taught during the ERT sessions. I'm saying if you want to get to get these more sophisticated learning outcomes, then you're going to have to create a learning pathway. And then I would argue then that ideally you should be building on prior knowledge. So we know this, when well, I mentioned this in the webinar number one, that good education design um, Learning happens when we are trying to use what the students already know or what their prior experiences have been, then they tend to be better learners and it allows us to um, create more sophisticated sets of knowledge and skills. Um, and that's the second one there, or the third one as well. This thing is in the way. All right, and then the, you know you've arrived when you've taught them something through a series of steps and then you ask them to now transfer this into a completely new context where suddenly you've got to take the training wheels off and you've got to see if they can actually apply these concepts and these uh, skills into something that uh, it's not immediately apparent how that would manifest itself. And so most of your ERT sessions, your learning pathway should really have some type of final assignment or a project whereby you get them to then take all these ideas that you've been building and get them to implement them in a new context. So that's what I'm trying to say here is don't feel that these ERT sessions have to be dumbed down. They don't. If you, if you sequence them nicely and you plan it beforehand, you can build quite sophisticated skill sets online. Okay. Here's a diagram, which I liked. I like little maps and stuff, all right? Um, and here is a number of learning pathways using the same little pieces of learning material. Some people talk about there being uh, learning assets or little nuggets of learning. So can't you assemble them so that some of them are reused in multiple ways, but they satisfy different learning pathways. So you don't even have to have only one learning pathway. You could have multiple sets of pathways. And the nice thing about this is we're trying to encourage lecturers to think about learning and people's learning pathways as not one size fits all, but each learner should ideally have their own learning pathway based on their strengths, weaknesses, needs, and challenges. So in your minds then, while you're planning your little learning pathway for your ERT sessions, you could also be thinking, well, how would they be reorganized so that different learners might approach the materials differently? And then that's what this person's trying to do here, um, LD4PE. Uh, kind of say you should try and go for like a transit map look. And you can see one learning pathway there is that green one. You can see there's a blue one and a red one, a bit like the London Underground, where you have those different train lines with different stations. But in this instance, the stations are little nuggets or ERT um, uh, sessions, which could then be joined together. So this was a very sophisticated one, okay? But if you look, for example, at the, uh, the intersection of all of those lines is uh, the, the course code is MBTA3. 
then you can see that was being reused in just about all of these learning pathways, where some of them are unique to another pathway. All right, so yeah, I'm uh, trying to just put out the idea out there that these ERTs could be reorganized, the sessions could be reorganized into multiple different approaches. Again, if you want to know more about this, there's that article from where the picture came from. It's that first resource. This one uh, 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 talks about the theory behind learning pathways, but also um, provides you with some options and different designs. The second one there is an EDUCORS um, video, which tries to talk about um, ideally how we should begin to develop personalized learning pathways for our students. And then the third one is a, is a, is a, is a book, it's more than an article, it's a whole series of chapters. Uh, but this particular chapter is on self-mapped learning pathways. So pr providing the student with quite a lot of um, autonomy in terms of choosing what their learning pathway might look like. All right, so there's again, OERs, click them, look at them, that'd be cool. What has become clear? Oh, have you got any questions? I think we should take a few questions before we push on. Is there anything? I've, I've, got, I've got one hand up, um, so I'm going to unmute the person who has their hand up and invite them to ask the question. There's also a lot of chat happening, so you can all keep an eye on that. I will, uh, because the chat is user-friendly today and not abusive, I will, we will get an edited version of this chat to share with everyone uh, afterwards. But um, Mawa, I've opened yeah, up. Yeah, the good. Cool. They're good. Mawa, okay. did you have a question? I didn't hear that. Okay. That's, All right, uh, Mawa, it seems to have gone. Right. So if there's any other questions that people have, please feel free to, put your, uh, to raise your hand uh, and then I can unmute you. At a suitable occasion, but otherwise, Andrew, I suggest you continue because that's all we have. All right. Yeah, no, we're running out of time today. Um, all right. So the next uh, little, the last little uh, principle, and but, but it's become very clear already just from our discussions today, is it's about time that you guys master that LMS. That LMS is a really useful way to um, organize and sequence and uh, create these learning pathways. And um, I know a lot of staff at universities um, begrudgingly engage with the LMS. It seems overly complicated. Um, the LMS unit is often quite unapproachable. <laughs> That's tickies for you. Um, but I'm, I think now in these circumstances, it's time to, to invest uh, some effort and some uh, opportunities to practice and get it right. All right. A learning management system will help you structure and sequence your ERT lessons. Many universities have an LMS, but it's also possible to use a free online version, although we've heard there are issues. All right. So here are the four little principles I'd like you to think about. Why, would, why am I saying it's time to get over yourself and uh, engage with the LMS? Um, Already today, we've mentioned, if you really want to go for a more sophisticated set of ERT sessions, you've got to think and plan and sequence them very carefully. And the LMS just makes that so much easier than just sending out a whole hot podge of resources and hoping the students can make sense of which order they are in. So the LMS is very useful for laying out your resources and your assignments uh, and then you can sequence them in the right order. And the idea then is you know that the students are working down the learning pathway that you have designed. And then if you want to um, also have all these fancy LMSs, where, uh, learning pathways, where there are multiple ways through the material, again, that's almost impossible without the LMS to help you sequence everything. Okay. The nice thing about the LMS is that all that all the problems with these WhatsApp groups and social medias and all that type of thing, which can get overwhelming sometimes and very, very busy, is that you can say we're only going to use the communication tools that are in the LMS. So the LMS normally has a little bouquet of communication tools ranging from discussion forums, which are nice because then you can see how the, the, the debate is evolving. 
especially if you use the threaded view, you can then see who's saying what and how it responds. And so it's asynchronous, of course, the discussion forum, but very nice. they have also got chat facilities in most LMSs. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so if you want to, you can schedule a chat session and make sure that you're in there and that you follow what they're doing. Um, they are, the nice thing is you, there's group email, so you can send a bulk email to the whole class and um, they all get the same thing. Or you can even have one-on-one -on -one or one-on-a-few email um, groups as well. So um, there's a whole host of communication tools available inside your elements. It's worth getting to know them. The beauty of the LMS, in my experience, is this, this third one, is when people say, oh, I submitted my assignment. And you say, oh, but I haven't got it. Oh, I emailed it to you. And then all oh, then is scratching around trying to find these things. None of that. The LMS is very strict about who submits when, and that puts it all in the same place. And it, um, it time stamps everything so you can see when people put things in. If you really want, you can get them to, when they submit. The, the machine sends them uh, uh, an alert telling them that it's all cool and that it's in the system and so on. So they know that they have submitted successfully and then it's all waiting for you later when you come in to grade them. And that's the fourth thing that's quite nice about your LMS is it's a place where you can sit and grade everything and if necessary build term marks and so on so it does all of that in one stop shop so your lms uh 10 years ago they were saying that these lms's are so passe and out of fashion but shucks there's nothing come to replace it yet there are some parallel systems which are useful but um yeah the lms is still king all right, and if you look at the little, um, can you click it again? Just click the, the thing, yeah. Um, you can see here's an LMS. This particular one is Moodle Cloud. It's a free version that you can just sign up for. Um, it's, it's limited in how many students you can have, but you can see with this example that um, it's very carefully sequenced. You can see that they come in, there's the recommended time and the method and an introduction and um, uh, little bits of text and all the resources and all the links and even the submission tool at the end. And so it's all very clear about how the students should sequence all the activities and resources and so on. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Here's another LMS. This is the one we're going to show you this afternoon, time permitting. Um, is Google Classroom. This one is, a, is um, both a free one and a school one. So if you don't have an LMS and you're in the market for an LMS, then this is one that you should have a look at. The free one, all you need is a Google account. And the vast majority of you have a Gmail account, so you've already got access to this particular classroom. And a few years ago, I was playing in here and I hated it. I thought it was really unfriendly and chunky and um, but they've really worked on it it's really nice now it's very easy to use and again you can see that even this webinar i was able to sequence the um the materials and the questions the little discussion things and you can see it's all very clear which order things should be uh tackled in and um uh yeah i'm a fan previously hated it now i'm a fan however it is very much out there and we've already heard from another um uh, webinar participant today that there are some security issues involved so be a little bit careful but in terms of getting in there and having a go i would advise it if um if you want your own personal one they do do a school version but then you have to uh, sign up as a school and there's a lot more protection in there and uh, they will only allow people into the school version who have Google accounts and so on and so on. So it's a little bit better. Here are our resources. If you want to know more about that, learning and course management systems. There's a thing from Vanderbilt to university. It's very thorough and it goes through all the different versions. So if you haven't got an LMS yet, have a look at that. Uh, introduction to creating a course on the Moodle cloud. So if you think you want to actually have your own version of Moodle, then have a quick look at that video. And it's actually part of a series of Moodle Cloud 
tutorials so you can decide how deep you want to go down the rabbit hole. And then there is another of these articles which you might want to read more at a much higher level. Three Pillars of Educational Technology, LMSs, Social Media, and Personal Learning Environment. So there's an article saying that the future, these three elements are going to be key. So yeah, if you want to have a look at that. I was going to ask a question. Um, have you, can we have a quick look? Is there anyone asking questions in the chat? No hands up at the moment, um, but we, we also only have about uh, five minutes mm -hmm. left, I think, before we need to wrap up. So, All right. Okay. Lots, lots of chat happening, which we'll edit and, and share with everyone. Cool. All right. Let's have a look at the next thing then. All right, so this afternoon's demonstration, somehow um, it took us ages to get through there today, but it um, hopefully it was useful. But our little demonstration today is Google Classrooms. So we'll see if we can get one or two of the videos in. There are four, but um, you can always come back and have a look later. What we were trying to cover was um, how to create your own classroom, how to lay out all your documents, and how to get your students into the classroom, and then how to uh, grade your students. So four little video clips to get you going. We'll just look at the first one. I think that's all we'll have time for. Just start with how to access our Google Classroom, and there's a few different ways to do this. Now, the way I tend to go uh, is just going up to the uh, up to, top to the Google Launch here of these nine little squares, the apps. And you can see Google Classroom is right here. And if you have it lower down, remember, you can drag these all around. So if it's something you're accessing quite a bit, uh, you can go ahead and do it that way. And then just go ahead and click on it, and it will open up Google Classroom. The thing I wanted to point to. Uh, sorry, Andrew, I'm not sure how long you want us to continue with that one for. No, I think let's ask people who are interested to go into the uh, presentation and, and have a look. Um, this first one basically tells you how to get your own classroom set up and get going. Then, as I said earlier, there's one on how to lay out all your materials and your activities. The third one is on how to get your students into the classroom. And the fourth one is on how to grade their assignments and so on. So we'll, I think we'll skip those because well, we've run out of time. As, as I've indicated to everyone in the chat, um, uh, it's also hard to share the audio with those videos from the PowerPoint slide deck the way I'm doing it at the moment. Um, but all, all of these are just embedded links in the PowerPoint slides. We will be as assembling another uh, email, which we'll send out to all participants with the recording from today, as well as all the slides. And you can go and view the videos from there. So let me just, before Andrew continues, let me just invite people also, if you've got any last questions or comments that you'd like to make, uh, please do raise your hand and we might have time for just one or two quick comments before uh, the session ends um, as we, we're getting close to the ending time. Andrew, are there any last comments you'd like to make while we're waiting to see if there's any questions? Um, I do have a slide that I want to go through on the summary just to sum up all the points, but we can do that after the questions. Okay. Um, just keep going. I've got one, I'm, I'm muting one now, uh, H. Skuman. Hi, everyone. It was just um, a comment um, where people said that um, there's a problem with assessment. I just think we need to start thinking out of the box. I mean, one can do really cool assessments, um, assessing critical thinking, um, collaboration, 21st century skills, if you just are not within the frame of mind of what um, what have I done the past 5 or 10 or 20 or 30 years while I'm teaching. That's it. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much for that. You've uh, stolen wonderful... my thunder. That is my, that's my key message for Webinar 3. I think assessment can be done summative assessment even, but we've got to think out of the box. We can't always do it the way we've previously done it, but are we going to go into some detail in the next webinar about how to do assessment and the different types of assessment? Thank you. That's a okay. good... One last quick comment, and then, Andrew, your summary slide is up. Uh, this is from an iPhone. I'm not sure what your name is. Sorry, because I disabled the ability to change your names, but you are unmuted now, the person who raised their hand. 
Yes. Um, I want to know if there is any way um, this training can be given on country by country basis, like in Nigeria, uh, hooked on this, and they don't know unless it's going to be a, a policy. Um, okay, so so we uh, unfortunately uh, audio independent. So the audio is breaking up a bit there, but I think the key question there was uh, maybe you can also just put it in the chat was about whether these uh, whether this training is going to be on a country by country basis. I think we will uh, chat further with um, Naduma about how to take this forward with, within the AAU context uh, once we finish the first round of training, because there are two more sessions still next week. Um, I'm sorry, I, unfortunately, your audio was breaking up, so we couldn't hear it properly. Um, Andrew, do you want to make a, a last couple of comments before we get to the end of our time? Yes. All right. Um, so educationally, it's always good to sum up, make sure that all the main messages come through. So I want to do that. And here are the four main take home pieces. All right. Choose curriculum topics that suit remote teaching. So we said theoretical subjects really do lend themselves to ERT, easy and great, and in some ways better. Um, but be a little bit careful then when you move on to those other types of subjects, such as practical ones or ones that need uh, supervision or perhaps are resource intensive. They can be done, but you need to be organized, creative and on top of your game. So I would say, yeah, some planning is needed if you want to go into those other ones. Choose activities, resources and tools that suit ERT. Remember, we use that grid to show the, the difference between high immediacy and high bandwidth and all the different types of tools in between where they fell into those various quadrants. You need to identify who your students are and what their context is for their learning and choose your tools and your resources appropriately. Okay, number three, sequence your ERT study sessions carefully. We said that um, it doesn't have to be only simple stuff. You can build more sophisticated teaching um, units uh, but again you need to be plan you need to plan you have to sequence them carefully and you've got to try and identify how they build on top of each other and then we said finally number four the easiest way to hold all of that together those that sequence and all those resources is to use your institutional lms to get friendly with it make sure that you spend the time to engage with it and understand how it works. Uh, if you really find that you don't have one at your institution, then investigate those personal ones. And we looked at two, Moodle Cloud and also the Google Classroom. They come with some security issues, but they, they can do the job. So there, there we go. That's my little summary for today's webinar. I'm hoping that was useful. Right. Thank you so much, Andrew. We've had um, lots of thanks coming through the chat uh, and lots of comments. You can also go through those and maybe pick up on a few of them uh, to integrate into the subsequent um, uh, presentations. So I'm going to just hand over to Nadumo to close up formally and then thank you all, everyone. And I'm just very relieved that we had uh, a hack-free, Zoom bombing-free session today because the last one was quite stressful. So I, I'm, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, also not being attacked and being able to chat to each other as well uh, in the session. Over to you, Naduma. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the facilitator, Andrew. Thank you, Neil and Tim. Thank you, everybody, for being an excellent audience. Uh, I think one of the consolations we are getting from these webinars is that we are not alone. Uh, we, we can work together, we can learn from each other, and we can move forward. Please don't forget webinar three, happening on the 4th of May, same time. It's about knowing if learning is happening during campus closures. Webinar four will happen on the 8th of May, and it's about communicating effectively during the campus closures. On behalf of the AAU Secretary General, I thank you once again. See you in the next webinar.
Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. I'm disconnecting now. Yeah.